In the book of Exodus, he looked at the children of Israel. It was the sixth month. And God said, because I'm speaking to you now, he said, this month is going to be to you the beginning of months. That means in the midst of the year, God said, what kickstarts a new season? It's not calendar, it's my word. Once I speak, it doesn't matter whether it's November, it can be the beginning of a new year. So that means the believer according to God is not subject to calendar months. So as opposed to calendar, God is a God of times and seasons. Your history is not just going to start in 2023. 2023 is just another latitude God is granting you so that it can extend to you the economy of the grace of God. So, so for the believer, 2023 doesn't exist in isolation. For you to optimize the year 2023, you must Abrahamize. So, so 2023 is not that year where you are having vision perpetually. I mean, you know, plans perpetually, paperwork perpetually, you must land it. So you come to the presence of God and everybody says, wow, because God is good. Could you reach out to somebody to your right and to your left and welcome them to church? I appreciate something about them. And if there's nothing to appreciate about them, tell them. <laughs> so... I mean, we appreciate Pastor Maury this morning. She's looking good. So, I have done something significant now. Because every now and then she would turn to me and she would say, you, you don't even appreciate how I look, okay? So, I would say, so I, so I would say, you know, you know, I'm going to preach. I need to focus on the word. <laughs> Meanwhile, when we, the, when we were in the university, at the University of Ibadan in those days, I was a pastor of the fellowship, so uh, the ministers used to sit together. So where I would go to preach is somewhere there. So she would sit there as one of the ministers. So I would scribble, while preparing, you say, I need to repent. God help me. While preparing for the teaching, I would also write a love poem. So, on my way to the pulpit, I'll just put it in a Bible. So, the people would think it was the announcement. <laughs> but I realized that the moment, the moment I start preaching, she'll just be uncomfortable. Because instead of listening to the worship, they're reading the poem. So, for that also, I had to repent. I said, God, it's... Uh, but we appreciate... We appreciate, we appreciate her immensely. She's been, I mean, the directors will testify that without her, this church cannot run. She's the one that is behind everything that you see. All I do every Sunday is just come and preach. I don't get involved at all with the running of this church. And it's because of Pastor Murray and the team. Thank you very much. We appreciate you. You know, when, when I say some things, people don't believe it until there are, there are witnesses here. Even when we're in Nigeria, but tomorrow we testify, in those days of being in Nigeria, I can't remember ever attending workforce meeting, maybe once or twice. Even here in Leicester, I don't get involved with director's meeting. I've only attended a meeting maybe once or twice, and it's not full. I just come to say what I need to say and I just leave. So we have very wonderful people. All the directors, shall we appreciate them again this morning? Please, we do. Let's appreciate the director. Would you please stand? All our directors, thank you. I mean, I, I don't know why I'm being drawn this way this month. Sincerely, these are the men and the women running things here. We salute you. And all that you do, your season of harvest is here. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Psalm 8, let's begin from there. So what I want to talk about this morning is the modus operandi of the new man. Now, this is part number three of the thesis of the new creation. And the beautiful thing about teaching in series like this is that we have all the time because we're not going to get off this until the end of the year. This is what we're going to consider. And it's important to pay attention. And I mean, this is a beautiful introduction of the thoughts this morning. Psalm 8. Oh, Lord, our Lord. I like that. How excellent is your name in all the earth. Who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infant, you have ordained strength. There's something about God. <laughs> because of your enemies. So that means spiritual warfare. It's, it's babes that should be handling things like that. There are, there are more serious things for the, for the matured in God. Because the Bible says, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infant, he ordained strength already. Why? So that, because of his enemies, so that he might silence them. So there's, there's one of the weapons of our warfare called silencer. My silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the works of your finger, <laughs> the moon and the star which you have ordained, then a question. What is man that you are mindful of him? I mean, look at the introduction they gave to us about God. You have all this going on. And yet you left all this and we know you are very much like Pastor Daly. You don't visit anyone. Who is this person you are visiting? Oh, you don't understand. It, this was God living. I, I mean, look at that introduction. Say, how excellent is your name? Angels. I mean, you can imagine everything that I created. 24 elders. And there was no record anywhere that God knocked on their door and visited them. And there was a day they were looking at, at God. He said, you've been going out in the cool of the day. Where have you been going? Who, who is this being that you are visiting? Have you ever fallen in love before? We never used to visit a girl. And suddenly we see you. I mean, we used to see that in those days in UI. I mean, a guy that is praying that is serious, and suddenly it's not serious again. Something has captured his heart. So they were looking at God. They said, you don't normally visit. As a matter of fact, we are even trying to book appointment to see you. It's always tough because there are protocols. There are things to break through in order to assess you, especially at the time when there was no blood because it was Christ that granted unto us access by the Spirit. Hallelujah. Amen. So that means it was not easy to assess God until Christ came. Yeah. Because one of the things Christ did for us was not just to forgive yeah. our sins, yeah. Is also to give us what is called access. So they now looked at God. They said, who is this person that you are visiting? There must be something. Look at, look at how they put that construct. What is man? Not only, we have noticed that ever since you created this being, we're, we're looking at your mind. You are just mindful of him. Your mind is full of him. That means even when we are talking to you and we are bringing reports, have you been mindful of someone before? As well, when, when you just fall in love, you're mindful of them. You're mindful that people are telling you serious things. <laughs> Miss Ariamu, the way you are laughing, it has happened to you before. They are telling you serious things. But all you are just seeing is Brother Stephen. <laughs> Maybe it's the other way around. They are telling Brother Stephen something serious. All she is just saying is Miss Because. They looked at God. He said, we were getting 100% attention from you, either two. But the moment you made this being called man, your mind is full of him. What did you invest into him that is eliciting this level of commitment to this being? So they found out that God was doing two principal thing, things. He said I was thinking about him or he was visiting him. It's not a man that you should visit him. Who is he? And sas and mas, this is with respect to the old man. If this is the account of the affinity between God and the old man, what do you think God is doing with the new man now? 
So that means God is trying to say that there is so much he has invested into man. And that is why, look, like what we started looking at last week. I'm going to start from there. In that, you see, you are not alone in this project called the new man. If God was mindful of the old man to this extent that even the entire creation had to watch God and they are like, you are you're already beginning to behave in a manner that we did not know either to. You are now mindful of someone. And, and not only are you mindful of someone, you are leaving the rest of us behind just to visit that individual. What is it about this individual? Please, can we take care of the baby? And possibly, if we can, please take him out to the children's church. We appreciate that. Thank you. If you can, please. But if you can't, no problem. Other uh, sister of bees, oh, bring him here. <laughs> Come on, bring him. <laughs> I said she'll bring him. She's running away. <laughs> I just wanted to bless the boy. She's not mindful of me. <laughs> no, it's okay. That you are mindful of him. Old man. So what is happening to the new man in Christ? That means out of everything God created, man occupies a very strategic position that God, only God himself can tell us how much he has invested into man. That is willing and willing again to make sure that that man is saved and eventually created the concept of the new man. Please, can you please come in? Um, with my ushers, please help make sure uh, there are no vacant seats. Uh, somebody can even take my seat. I don't like it when people stand. Please just be sure. Uh, Sister Remy, please, can we have something done there to make sure that nobody's uh, standing or sitting outside? Um, and as it's getting fuller, some of us will have to uh, lead us, maybe volunteer our seats. So that's all the, all right, okay. Let's get into it. So, now, this is very important. What is man? And if this is being asked about man, what we want to ask this morning is that, what is the new man? That you are willing to send your son to die and you, not just that, there's an investment of your spirit. Because the man is describing here, Jesus did not die for him, and yet God was mindful of him. The man that is describing here did not have the Holy Spirit, quote and unquote, and yet God is so mindful of him. So what do you think God is doing with you and I? Why is man so important to God? That, that it does appear if you look at the entire universe, the, everything that God is doing is centered around man. Let's look at it again Romans 8.26 and Romans 8.37. And vis-a-vis -vis Luke 22.31, the story of Jesus and Peter. Likewise, look, the new man. Please don't miss me here now. I'm, I'm just about to start teaching now. One of the reasons why the epistles were written is because the new man is still not knowledgeable about what God did for him. He doesn't still know. You see, becoming born again doesn't mean you know. So the epistles were written to show you, when, you see, the problem is that when you are going for the altar call and you are coming back, I mean, that construct itself, you know, people say they give their life to Jesus. <laughs> you, you can't give your life to Jesus because you didn't even have a life. You were dead. So when you become born again, what happened or what happens to you is that you receive the life of God because you don't have anything to give. You are not at the giving end. You are at the receiving end. So, so people just say, I surrender. Oh, okay, lift up your hands, say this prayer after me. However... It, there's nothing wrong with that. But what we're saying is that it doesn't matter where that happened and how that happened, you don't still know what happened. 
it's, it's impossible to know what happened. It will take years of studying, of praying. And that is why, in order for that journey to, to be cut short, God inaugurated somebody like Apostle Paul to write a piece so as to tell the new man what happened to him. So much happened that people don't know. So that is why the Holy Spirit is also number two. And that's number one, the epistles were written to keep him. And if you read the epistles, please watch me here. You will realize that virtually all the truths therein are written in the past tense. For those who be for new, he didn't say he's going to know you. He also called pastors. For those who he called, he also justified. And those who he justified, he also glorified. By his stripes, you were healed. Why do you think those truths are written in the past tense? It's because something happened. And look, for, for instance, now people thought they just became born again. Until when you begin to read the epistles, you now begin to see that actually you died with him. Yeah. But, but see, the preacher that got you born again didn't tell you you died. Yeah. And that you were actually buried with him, past tense. Yeah. But that's not the end of the story. You rose with him. So, if not for the epistles, you, you will just be looking at the passion of the Christ and you'll be getting sorry for Christ. Meanwhile, the epistle is telling you that is your story. Yeah. You were involved, you were there. Yeah. And the reason why 2,000 years after you are saying I surrender all is because you were there. So, your story is deeper than trying to pass an MBA. Your story is deeper than I'm trying to pay a bill. Your story is deeper that there's no sister that has said yes to me. <laughs> Am I standing in front of a brother? Is that your story? <laughs> Not anymore. So his sister has said yes. <laughs> so, so, so what we're saying is that what is the deepest concern that you have? Your life is a very powerful, epic Ah, story. That is, imagine you, you, want, you were once buried. You, you didn't know that, that you were once buried. So if they say they want to bury you now, I mean, some of those African prayers that people pray, how, how is that your concern? That you have been somewhere that even, that is why it is an anomaly for a believer to be afraid of demons. <laughs> how can you fear what fears you? They, they are so afraid of you because they are looking at your story. And, and the beautiful thing is that when the Lord was doing all this, he made a public show of everything. Yeah, yeah. So, that, so that 2,000 years after, nobody can deny and say, oh, oh, it didn't happen. It happened in the public. That's why Christ was crucified in the public. Because that's the only way he can triumph over them in it. <laughs> Imagine what you have been through in life. So that means there was a time you were once buried. But you rose. So how can you now, because of house rent, be looking this way? That you that survived death. Glory. <laughs> so the new man is a collective agency. You are not alone. That is why we said last week, you are in Christ. See, that notion of being in Christ alone is enough. If, if, even if that is the only truth that you know, that number one, whatever your name is now, Joshua Wale Adeshola, is no longer seen. That means once you show up, it's Christ that is seen. You are in Christ. So that means what can never happen to Christ can never happen to you. Because you see, this is how the realm of the spirit is. In the realm of the spirit, identity is everything. That was why the moment Jesus showed up, the, Satan had to tell him, if you are the son of God. Because had Jesus, had he turned the stones to bread, what he just declared to the realm of the spirit is that I'm not sure I'm the son of God. Because that temptation is for the one who is not sure. Because that temptation is if you are the son of God. So it is only if you are the son of God, you carry out that temptation. Since you know you are the son of God, you don't. That is why it's temptation. 
Imagine Jesus did not know who he was and he was struggling with that because in that realm, identity is everything. That was why before he went to that realm, the father told him, you are my beloved son. Mm -hmm. And it's not the fasting and prayer that will make me to be pleased. I'm already pleased. Because you don't go into the realm of the spirit to, to get validation. No. You, will, you will become a victim by the time you are coming back. You start turning stones to bread and you justify it. But, but the Lord knew better. He knew a very strong identity. And he said, look, I don't need to turn stones to bread to prove I'm the son of God. With or without that, I am the son of God. So imagine what already happened to you. That is why it is important, and I'm happy in this season of fasting and praying, all we've been doing in this fasting and praying period, we have never prayed a single deliverance prayer. But see, look, those are for infants. When you become matured in God, there are more important things to pray about, not about, you know. And guess what? We've, we've been praying the epistles. We've been praying everything about the new creation realities. And it's getting more and more serious. Because you need to go back to Ephesians, to Romans, to, to know what happened to you. Because half of your realities, you don't even know. You know the one you know is evil altar. People in my village. When believers still talk like that, is it not a shame? Because the truth is that that is not even your story. Some people just sold us a lie, and we have believed a lie. So, so the meaning of our story is this. Whatever is not in Christ is not for us. Look at whatever anyone is saying. Can we find this in Christ? Because your operational protocol is in Christ with Christ and through Christ. That, that was why Paul could say, I can do all things through Christ. That means the empowerment of the believer is through Christ. And that's why at times even when you don't fast or pray, you see that true Christ can still empower you, that consciousness. Because no matter how spiritual you are, there are times you won't still pray as you ought to. That is why the Bible said the Spirit also helps our weaknesses. You know what? That is the difference between the old man and the new man. The old new man is a collective agency. The old, see, the same way God is mindful of him, the same way the Holy Spirit says this project must not fail. The Holy Spirit is helping our weaknesses. So if you are saying... Anger is my weakness. Or when I look at the woman, I can't take my eyes off. Or pornography is my weakness. Whatever the weakness is, it's because you are not receiving the ministry of the Spirit. Because he knows that the new man is still possible for him to have weaknesses. And that's why the Holy Spirit is saying, the new man is not going to be an, an offline product. It's going to be online. So when he wakes up every morning, there are updates. He's connected, except he's not connected. You know you can have a phone, and you are not connected. Nonetheless, it's still a phone. Because that is what is happening to so many people. But, but do you wake up in the morning, and by the time you put on your phone, Google will say there's an update. Download the latest version. And that's why the Holy Spirit will look at your anger. You say there's an update to deal with this anger. Download the latest version. But your data is switched off. You are offline. So you are not receiving the updates. So you are not downloading. So a lot of people only upload. They don't download. They only upload. They don't download. How about downloading? You see, that app, there's a latest version of it. And the moment you download this one, anger will disappear. Because the Holy Spirit is mindful of the fact that there are weaknesses. He helps our weaknesses. And look at the first weakness. For we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. Prayer warrior. So brother, prayer warrior, no matter how much you pray, you are not still praying as you ought. Because this is the reality of the new man. You also see that the epistles, they show us the gaps yeah. in the story of the new man. Because there are still gaps. 
And the reason for that gap is because <laughs> Paul himself had to say it in Romans 8. He said, everything that is still happening now is the first fruit of the Spirit. Imagine Paul calling all that happened in his time and in his day. He said, those of us who have the first fruit of the Spirit, we groan within ourselves. Oh, this is the first fruit. So that means there's still more. There's much more. So, so if, if you call that the first fruit, what is the last fruit going to look like? But he said, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself. Yes. Pastor Moni and I were discussing this. Was it yesterday or the day before yesterday? The Spirit himself makes intercession for us. You are too important not to have a prayer partner. So the Lord is saying, even if you don't have a physical prayer partner, as a new man in Christ, because this investment is important, I'm mindful of it. I will assign you an automatic prayer partner. He's making intercession. That's what the Bible says, himself. <laughs> but the spirit himself, even when you are not involved. But, but he likes you to be involved. That's why at times he taps you at 2 a.m. He says, let's pray. But here you are, you are snoring. And the spirit said, this investment is too important. So I will by myself. Makes intercession. And what is intercession? Standing in the gap. That's right. There are gaps. And the Holy Spirit said, before that gap begins to affect you, I stand there. It's an automation. That means the new man is a collective agency. You see, this autonomous life that you are, you are self-determining, self-governing is the problem. And that is what religion tries to do. Religion tries to tell you, you are alone. But the reality of the new man is saying, there is a partner. The Spirit himself makes intercession for us. Look at it. With groanings, which cannot be uttered. Every time you see groaning in the Bible, there is a gap. Why did Paul groan? He said, we groan within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. That means a time came, Paul knew this body could not take him to the next level. So what did Paul start doing? He started groaning. So, so, and that is why this season, as we get to the end of the year, you will realize that for so many of us, there will be economic groaning in our spirit. Because here you are, you are supposed to have transited to another level economically, but you are still somewhere. So, so that is why the Holy Spirit is always like, what is the gap? What is the problem? What is standing in the way? What is creating this gap? So the Spirit stands there. And look at the next verse. Now he who searches the heart knows what the mind of the spirit is. What does it do? It makes intercession for the saints. You know, one of the gaps, again, is that you don't even know the will of God most of the time. Like those who just finished, we just graduated now. What do you want to do? For the most part, believers want to run the operating system according to the course of this world. So, and what is the cause of this world? I've, I've, I'm, I now have a master's. Let me start looking for a job. Who told you that is what you should do? Hmm. And you now see the you see believers joining the rat race, as if there's no bam in Gilead. As if it's the day you graduated, the Holy Spirit just got to know. So you are the one that showed the Holy Spirit your certificate and say, "Eh, uh -huh, I've graduated, though." I have first class though. Before you begin to say we should not. <laughs> and those will now say, hey, hey. Wow. wow. So you are finished. Thank you for the update. Let me start looking for a job for you. Yeah. Ah. Is that the way it works? Wow. <laughs> Ever before you came to the UK. That is why it is important to find out what the will of God is. He's already making intercession. That by the time Tade is finishing MSC project management, he's going to Accenture. The Holy Spirit is already accentuating your story. Well, here you are. Your friend said, oh, Leicester City Council, they are taking people. They are taking people. Look at the console. They are taking people. So you're about to be taken. <laughs> Oh, they are taking people. And you too. Boo, 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 boo. And the Holy Spirit said, No, I am making intercession for you according. That means once you go outside of the will of God, it is dangerous for this product. It must be according to the will of God. 
That's why when I heard the testimony of Dr. Kemi, I did it. Now she came to the UK, and there's nothing wrong with that. Doctors will come do blab and do all that. And she said, that is not the will of God for me. That the will of God for me is to go into this or go into that. And I'm like, those are the kind of testimonies you want. You see, your story must not fit into the popular story. Because the genius of God is too much for him to grant all of us breakthroughs the same way. That's why in the ministry and life of our Lord Jesus Christ, he never healed two people the same way. Because the genius of the economy of God is massive. That yes, God wants to give all of us breakthroughs, but different ways. Somebody can get his own at Leicester City Council, but that doesn't mean that's your story. And that's why stop following. You see, these are the things I get into, and a lot of people don't like it when we touch some of these things. But I won't get into it today. And for those who are just coming into the UK, you see, for those of us who are just coming in, you are better off because now you are hearing this. In these early days, find out what is the will of God for you. Because the Holy Spirit is saying, I'm making intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Look at verse 36. Oh, God. As it's written, no, no, verse 30, what is that? 37. Yet in all these things we are more than conqueror through him who loved us. Let's look at where the Lord himself lives to make intercession for us. What verse is that? Now we've seen the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the Lord himself. Please, can you look up the verse for me? Oh, look at that. 34, one to go everyone. It is Christ. And furthermore, and is where? Who also, what is the meaning of also? That means there is an earlier intercessor. Who also does what? Doctor, you are too important. God is too mindful of you that one intercessor is not enough. So he, he said, Lord, the Lord said unto the Lord, he said, now that you have ascended and you are at my right hand, you only have one ministry. They're already saved. You've already shed your blood. They don't, you've already granted unto them victory. But there's, a, oh, there's still a problem. There's still a gap. They don't know my will. So you need to be interceding for them. Sister Alera, imagine the Lord is interceding for you to go north, but you are going south. That's a problem. That's a problem. We act as if we're alone. Look, this project called the new man, you are not supposed to act alone. It is situated within a broader context that God is involved, the Holy Spirit is involved. And it is important you situate yourself within the framework they are creating for you in order for this project to succeed. How beautiful it is when a life is well aligned. Well aligned. That you are like, God, okay, this is what my hand finds doing now. I will do it. But I'm not going to do it as if I'm hopeless. As I'm doing it, I'm also watching out for the next instruction. And the day you tell me, stop this, move into this, I know my faith journey just started. Because for Abraham, the Abrahamization of my story is as such that one day I will leave the known for the unknown. And whenever you are trying to introduce me to the unknown and I do not follow, uh, that is, that is I, I just become ordinary. I start working according to the course of this world. And, and that is not good for, for anybody. So the new man must be told. It must be explained to him, which is why the epistles were written, what happened to him. Because the main issue with the new man is the issue of ignorance. Praise God forevermore. Look at Luke 22, 31. We're looking at that again. And we'll quickly look at what we have for today. So this is just repeating. Luke 22, 31, and the Lord said, now this is a classic example of what we're talking about. He said, Simon, Simon, indeed, this is the Lord saying, he said, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. So now that Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat, let's start a vigil. <laughs> 
So we are just getting to know the intention of the enemy. But look at the next thing the Lord said. And the Lord said, but I have prayed for you. Brian, can you imagine this was Satan? I mean, this was Peter eating chicken and Nando's. He, he was not even aware. Because if, if you are left alone to prosecute every issue of your life, you are, you are an old man. For the new man, even when you don't know what the enemy is up to, there is an agency working for you. So ever before Peter knew what was happening, Jesus already cleared it. He didn't say, I'm going to be praying for you. He said, I have prayed for you. I pray for you. You are not even aware. So, so because what at times many of us call spiritual warfare is that suddenly you are aware and you want to resolve it. As if we don't have the God that five years before now, he has already picked what is going to happen. And in the realm of the spirit, he already sent to it. So he didn't say, I'll be praying for you. He said, I'll pray for you. Even though I'm telling you now, you are just getting to know now. That means the Lord is telling Peter that there is nothing the enemy is up to. Once you are a new man and you are in Christ or you are with Christ, we know already. We don't just leave it to you. Because there are certain things, no matter how spiritual you are, you won't still pick. So pick it on your behalf. We'll deal with it. I pray for you. I pray for you that the enemy should not sift you. No, he said, I pray for you that your faith should not fail. That means for the new man, he doesn't pray against the enemy. He prays for you. The investment is in you. That means if you can realize who you are and what is in you, and that is where I want to start the teaching from today. Why faith? I pray for you that what? Doctor, that's why I said one of the things that must happen to the new man is that it must be, ex it must be explained to him mm -hmm. what happened. Why out of all the prayer points? How do we pray today? If this were to be today, what would be the prayer point? Somebody tell me. What, what likely the prayer point is going to be? The prayer point is likely going to be, oh, he wants to sift you as wheat. So the secret is wheat. So we de-wheat you. <laughs> We're going to go into a victim. And the purpose of that victim is the wheatization of Peter. We need to remove every wheat tendency. Every, that, that's what we we'll do. Or to say, he wants to sift you. Oh, we got what the enemy wants to do is sifting. So every sifting power of the enemy, every sifting strategy of the enemy, we frustrated. Every sifting mechanism. See, that's not how the Lord operates. That's not how he prays. Check your entire Bible. You hardly find anywhere where the Lord prayed against the enemy. What the Lord does is that he prays for. He makes intercessions for us, not against the enemy. Because for the Lord to begin to pray against the enemy is an acknowledgement of the fact that the enemy is here to be defeated. You don't, you don't defeat again the one you have defeated. Imagine you are trying to defeat the one that you have defeated. So what did he say to Peter? He looked at Peter. He said in this season of fasting and prayer, and, and may I say this, those who have not joined us, I mean, we just have how many days to go? We're finishing on Thursday. Today is day 17 of 21. You can still join us. Because why is faith? So I pray for you that your faith should not fail. Look at me, everyone, and trust the word of God. The greatest investment of God in you is your faith. It must not fail. Out of everything to pray for, Rachel, or not, you can imagine, Sister Shabi, out of everything to pray for, the Lord looked at you. He said, I'm not praying. What the enemy wants to do is, is, is not important. What is important is you. Your faith. That means if what the enemy wants to do is going to be done, it's not because the enemy is powerful, it's because your faith failed. So the failure of your faith is what is creating spiritual warfare for you. Because on the faith lane, is it that you are crossing the Red Sea or you are fighting Pharaoh? Oh, yeah, you are not. You see, people who don't cross the Red Sea fight Pharaoh. And the thing fighting Pharaoh is spiritual warfare. Meanwhile, all you need to do is to cross the Red Sea. The Red Sea will drown Pharaoh. 
But, but because you are afraid to take a step of faith to cross the Red Sea, you will not get into religion. And that's what we call spiritual warfare. And you are looking at Pharaoh. You are looking at Pharaoh. You this Pharaoh. <laughs> Meanwhile, cross the Red Sea. The Egyptians are saying to do so will be drowned. That means your faith will draw out the enemy in a manner yeah. that confronting them directly cannot do. Imagine Israel was trying to confront the army of Pharaoh, but by crossing the Red Sea, yeah. what they crossed created a gap. That's right. And that was what drowned the enemy. That's right. yeah. That's right. So faith is always a higher form of warfare. Yeah. That is why if ever there is something the enemy is attacking, it's not sifting you as wheat. Look, the enemy is a liar. This is Jesus again revealing to us the modus operandi of Satan. That means once you identify what the enemy is doing, that is not really what he's doing. It's a decoy. So you'll have thought what the enemy was up to was to sift Peter. It's to, it's to, it's to make you, it's to fool you. But Jesus said what he's trying to do is to make your faith to fail. Say, so I have prayed for you. Oh, you can imagine. We're here this morning now, and somebody's here in this room, and the Lord is there in heaven, and he's interceding for you. And he's looking at you. I'll be standing in the gap for you. Just remember someone somewhere now in heaven is praying for you, calling out your name, praying for your strength. I'll be standing in the gap for you. So the Lord is saying, hey, the problem is not your marriage. The problem is your faith. Because if your marriage fails, it's because your faith failed. That means the Lord is saying, I'm praying for the substance of things you hope for. I'm praying for the evidence of things not yet seen. I'm praying for that same thing that through this by faith, we understand that the words were framed by the word of God. I'm praying for the word of Hebrews 11, all the insights there and resources there to be domiciled in your spirit and for you to act it out. That means it is whenever you are going through struggles, you should begin to watch out what is the faith instruction here and what is the faith project here. Hallelujah. Amen. Is somebody there? Yes. That your faith will not fail. And he looked at Peter. He said, because your faith will not fail, you will be converted. You will strengthen your brethren. Look at how I put it. When you have returned to me. Because that's the only way. You will strengthen your brethren. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. You will strengthen your brethren. Hmm. Why faith? I will close. Jude 20. At the beginning of the service this morning, a prophetic word came telling us how much God is set to do as we progress into the ending of the year. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the genius of it. Every other person can be doing any other thing, but you, beloved, building up yourselves, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, now, this is the scripture establishing a correlation between faith and the ministry of the Spirit. Somebody will say, okay, I know that thing is in me because you will never see. Now, listen to this. This is very, very important. Anywhere in the Bible that tells the new man to be looking for faith. Throughout the Bible, faith is given as far as the new man is concerned. You are a faith being. So the new man is not looking. That's why I looked at Peter. Even though Peter did not realize, he didn't say, I'm praying so that you have faith. He said, I'm praying that your faith is already your faith. It's already there. Paul was looking at Timothy. He said, when I consider the unfeigned faith that was in your grandmother, Louis, in your mother, he knows. He said, I'm also persuaded it's in you. But here was Timothy. He did not know it was in him. So Paul did not need to pray for Timothy to have faith. The moment you become born again as a new man, you are already ordained unto faith. Because even that project that made you to become born again is a faith project. By grace, you were saved through faith. So it's already, you see, faith is already referenced in your story. All you just need to do is to acknowledge it. You are a faith being. 
That means to live outside of faith is not to live because the just shall live. So if the just shall live by faith, how can the just not have what is going to live by? But there is also what is called movement from faith to faith. Right? That is why it is important to pray in the spirit. Because now we're now seeing that the more you pray in the spirit, you are not generating faith. You are building yourself on it. Oh, that means, look, that faith for Peter, it has already defeated Satan. Because First John 5, 4, for whatever is born of God overcomes the world, and this is the victory. So the intercession Christ was making for Peter is so that it can be built on his most holy faith. Because faith itself is already a victory. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why Jesus looked at Peter. He said, you want to know the source of victory in this warfare that you have carelessly put yourself? Your faith. Because this is the victory. This is the victory. So, so in this season, we wake up in the morning and you are praying in the Holy Spirit. What are you doing? You are doing two things simultaneously. Number one, you are defying yourself. <laughs> because, you see, many people like to come to church, and there's nothing wrong with that to be edified. But if all that we do this morning hands here, and we don't carry it home, for you to go back home and to continue to edify yourself. You see, it gets so interesting. You wake up 12 midnight and you sit in your study or wherever you are and for the next three hours, you are just tonguing. Zephra kadoma kasidam. In fact, you don't even know it's three hours because you are just there, you know, because and by the time you come out, look at what the Bible says. It said the faith that is in you, right? It's already your most holy faith. It cannot be holier than this, right? It's already your most holy faith. But the problem is that there is a gap between you and that faith. You are not built on it. That faith is sitting on this side. You are on this side. You are not on the same page. So when you begin to pray in tongues, what it does is an adjustment, an alignment. So that by the time you speak in the morning, you are talking the same spirit of faith. Right, you can imagine by faith what, what has already happened to many of us. But by facts, you are denying what happened by faith. And that's why the story of the new man is the story of faith. Outside of faith, you cannot even understand the new covenant. Because it's a covenant written for people of faith and people of the spirit. So that the bandwidth of faith is connected to the bandwidth of the ministry of the spirit. And that creates a, a, a blended value that no devil can attack. And that's the blessing of Abraham. Galatians 3. We'll come back here. This life that I have is the life of Christ in me. This life that I have is the life of God. Zoe, 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 Galatians 3.13, look at that, Christ has redeemed us from the cause of the law. Ah. Mm. <laughs> you know, I just stopped that doctor came in to say Selah, because how can, after 10 years of becoming born again, you still feel you're under a cause? Did he say Christ is redeeming us? He has what? Redeeming us. That is why in Nigeria, a credit in English is very, very important. It's so that we can understand scripture. But there's a difference between as redeemed or we redeem. If you fast and pray more, he will redeem. He has what? Dr. Adeshewa, is that good? That is, that's why a, a C5 is good. A C6 is not good. Oh, that's borderline. You should have C4. How many of us have distinctions in English here? Help us. Anyone with distinction, because we need you now. We need you. 
Anyone? Distinction in English? You got distinction? Distinction in English. Help us, please. <laughs> what is that scripture saying? Because at times religion is the opium of the people. We don't. He has redeemed us. What is it? Past tense. No, no. Don't say past tense. Explain it. <laughs> Christ has redeemed us. It has happened. It's something he has done before that we are just walking into. He has done it. So it's already our most holy faith. But we are not built on it. So that's why we pray in tongues. So that we can build ourselves on what Christ did already. Because it's a faith thing. How can Christ... Re See... It does not matter the cause your great-grandfather or great-great-grandfather inflicted on your grandfather. <laughs> Have you read the book of Leviticus? Do you know how many cause of the Lord there, there was? I can't, and the cause of the Lord is even, not even a man causing a man. This is God invoking causes. And by the time Christ died, we were redeemed from that. But, but after you were redeemed from that, you still believe the one from your village is stronger than this one. You also forgot that the moment you became born again, please, can you reduce the volume, please? The moment you became born again, you don't belong to that village again. If any man is in Christ, he's a knee. So you cannot be born again and still be Igbo, or Yoruba, or Hausa, or you are a Chinese, or a Congolese, or a Nigerian. That's the problem. Because he has redeemed us out of every tribe, out of every tongue, and he has made us kings and priests unto himself. That means there's no good tribe. That was why he redeemed us. So for you to still be ethnocentric after becoming born again, still seeing yourself as Yoruba or Igbo, and you cannot relate freely, it's a stronghold in the mind. Hallelujah. Christ has redeemed us from what? The cause of the Lord having become a cause for it is written. Cause is everyone who hangs on a tree. Why? That what? The blessing. I know we sing it. And that's why a time will come also. One of the things we need to do is to revisit a lot of our songs. One of the things we say is that Abraham's blessings are mine. Right? That's not scripture. The Bible never said blessings. It's not plural, it's singular, it's blessing. Did you see? That the blessing is just one. And it's so serious that you see it, you imagine why couldn't Abraham, after he gave it to Isaac, also give, give Ishmael? He couldn't. You would think Isaac was wicked. Esau was begging him. He said, bless me also. And the guy said, I've already blessed your brother. Because it's just one blessing. And he's got it. It was supposed to be Reuben. Reuben missed it. Joseph got it. But in Christ, we didn't miss it. It was given to us. That the blessing of Abraham might do what? Do you know? Oh, God. Do you know those of us who are Africans, those of us who are Gentiles, non-Jewish people, are even more blessed in the gospel than the Jews? Because this is now saying that this particular one is even for the Gentiles. But here are the Gentiles. They are still thinking what happened in their village 400 years ago is stronger than what happened in Christ 2,000 years ago. That the blessing of Abraham might come upon the Gentiles. What is that blessing? That we might receive what? Through what? So the moment the ministry of the Spirit is integrated into your faith walk, that is a blessing. Did you see? <laughs> and that is what tongues do. That's why tongues. Look at it again. Building up yourself on your most holy faith, praying the Holy Spirit. Most holy faith, praying the Holy Spirit. Most holy faith, praying the Holy Spirit. Integration of faith flow into the ministry of the Spirit. Integration of the ministry of the Spirit into the faith flow. So that your faith is alive. So that what God has walked in is now what the Holy Spirit is now placing demands on you to walk out. That is what, what, talk, what he meant when he says, walk out your salvation. You know, walk it out. As we close this point, let's look at Ephesians 1. The manner of praying for the new man. I will close. Ephesians 1, 16. 
Oh, God. Are you getting something this morning? Hold the hand of your neighbor and pray in the Spirit for just a minute. We cry, Abba, Father, hallowed be your name. Make sure you're praying for someone and be sensitive. What is the Lord telling you about the person, that individual you're praying for? Mm. When that place this morning said that with every joint supplies, it's not just coming from Pastor Dele, it's also coming from all of us. And everyone is also reaching out to the order. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name. Amen. I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. How do we pray for the new man? That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. Why do we pray for the new man? Next verse. That the eyes of your understanding. The greatest problem with the new man is ignorance. Once you begin to pray these prayers, there are certain prayers you will never pray again. Because what you now need now is what is called a, a fortizo, a photoelectric effect. So that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. The eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. Not that anything new will happen. It's so that you may know. Look at all of us here now. There is no one under the sound of my voice that is not called. But see, once you don't know you are called, you will think, oh, Pastor Dele is called, Pastor Mark is called. That is why they are doing the things that... But you see, you came to Leicester. Your coming to Leicester is a calling. But the problem is this... If you, the eyes of understanding, if it's not, if the eyes of your understanding, if they are not enlightened, you will know that there's a hope, there's hope in that calling. You know, when a man is hopeless, it's because he doesn't know a lot of things. What is the hope of his calling? What are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saint? Rachel, now look at that. We're all, all looking for an inheritance in God. But God is saying, let me tell you why I'm mindful of you. There's an inheritance in you that even God himself is interested in. He didn't say the inheritance in heaven. He said the inheritance in the saint. You see, why God is not mindful of you, he has planted an inheritance in you, and he doesn't want to lose it. What are the riches of the glory of inheritance in the saint? What is again? What is the extreme greatness of his power? Let me make this last statement and we'll draw the curtain. It is not every power of God that is in heaven. <laughs> There's a power of God. He measures the power of God in the believer. That's why at times when you are praying to God to do something for you, God is also looking at you to do something. Because God is saying, I didn't carry all the power to heaven. There's an exceeding greatness of my power that is towards you. And that's what the Bible says unto him that is able to do exceeding and abundantly above what we can ever ask or think according to the power that is in heaven. No. According to the power that works where? In us. So th there are many things we're asking God to do. God is always saying, I'm waiting on you. Do. Because the measure of power that is required to effect that change is already what is in you. And in I explain the measure that is working in us. Look at what is extending of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. Which he did what? Sister so, Funke, if I tell you that the power you now have is equal to the one God used to raise Christ from the dead. Will you believe it? So that means when God used that resurrection power, he didn't take it back to heaven. He planted it in the saint. He said, should in case anything should arise again that looks like this. 
<laughs> and that shows us again another attribute of God. Pastor Murray, that revelation just came now. Whenever God manifests power on the earth to do anything, he does not take that power back to heaven. The power that is in heaven are the ones God has never used on the earth. Whenever something happens on the earth, it's left on the earth. That means from that day, once you see a manifestation of power at that level, that was why the day he healed the sick, healing the sick became available. He doesn't take it back. But guess what? When he now sent the Holy Spirit, he now said even the ones in heaven and on the earth is packaged again in a single agency, you shall receive power. About the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Imagine. So when he raised Christ from the dead, you were looking at that story, how the stone was rolled away, how Christ rose. And the Lord is saying, that is the extent of the power that I've already made. That's why we said the new man must be told what he has. And let's close with Ephesians 6 again. How do you fight? Oh, God. What verse is that? We, do, we rest not against flesh and blood. Put on the whole armor of God. How do we fight? Put it on. That means, doctor, the believer, you have access not to just the armor of God, the whole armor of God, the whole armory. So when he says fighting principalities and powers, he didn't say fight them with your own weapon. So not only is power made available to the new man, the new man, also everything in the weaponry of God, in the arsenal of God, is his. All things are yours. So the Bible says put it on. So that you may be able to stand against the wise of the devil. How do you stand? Put it on. Like I said, if this were to be AK-47, just cock it and stand. That's how to fight. Look at us, we have having done all stand. If somebody should come in with grenade here now, and he says, <laughs> if you want to be blown away, you go out of that door. You all sit there. And yes, on a good day, if you take on the guy, it's like... <laughs> Bra Casey, on a good day, you give him a pack on. But let Casey and do pump action now. Back up. They say, if I'm not born you well, go through that door. What is he doing? He's showing forth the weapon. If America wants to fight you, they just send a carrier to your coast. It's enough a statement. They will say, President, resign. You don't want to resign. Two days after, about five aircraft carriers are on the coast of Lagos with a submarine just going around. What are they showing? They are saying, we stand. If you want to misbehave, remember, why can't America go and rescue Ukraine? Oh, yeah. Oh, they should not invade Ukraine. The whole world, they should not invade Ukraine. If Russia was not behind the invasion, you can imagine what would have happened. They should not invade Russia was just speaking pidgin English. He said, if not born you well. <laughs> you know why? A day before the war, Putin just made sure that show our nuclear arsenal. Remind the whole world that we have weapons that can end this civilization in five seconds. That means if Russia should release all the nuclear weapons that they have, we won't be here. Then America remembered. Ah, what you are doing is not good. This is morally. <laughs> then Nigeria now wanted to go and rescue Niger. <laughs> and Russia said, anyone that interferes with the crisis in Niger. Before Nigeria was like, we are going. No, this cannot be happening. Democracy, democracy. <laughs> Russia said, if they not born you well, enter, enter the J. Now nobody's talking the J again. 
That is how to treat the enemy. Just bring out the weapons. And remember, these weapons, they are not your own. It's a armor. Even if your armor is failing, how about the armor of God? He said, put on the whole armor. And one of the ways to put on those armor, or the armor, is to wake up and begin to pray in the spirit. Oh, praying with all kinds of prayer and supplication in the spirit. It's a weapon of warfare. And that's why I said the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. It's a collective weaponry, but they are mighty through God. Not just you alone. God is involved. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Oh, we give you praise. We give you praise. Can we pray in the spirit for one minute, everyone? We give you praise. We give you praise. Thank you for the weapons of our warfare. They are not carnal, but they are mighty true God. Mighty true God. Mighty true God. As we pull down strongholds. Mighty true God. As we pray with all prayers and supplication in the spirit. As we watch to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saint. In Jesus' name. Upper Sunday, we'll start looking at how to complain with all the saints. Because one of the things God wants to do with a new man is so that all of us have the same level of comprehension. This one, that this one is praying like this, this one is saying like this, it's not supposed to be. We should all speak the same thing. We should all be mindful of the same thing. Especially, at least those of us who are in the same local church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give to the Lord as we close the meeting this morning. Um, next Sunday, we're having our Father... Pastor Dr. Tune Bakare, his beloved wife here. Mrs. B, like we call her Pastor Bakare's wife, was born in Leicester. <laughs> in 1960, she was born here. So she's coming back home. And she's not been here since. So she's just come for the first time to come to Leicester. And she was born in Royal Infirmary. You could imagine. <laughs> History is funny. You can imagine that she was actually born here in the city. So when we were coming to Leicester, they were saying, like, that was where I was born. <laughs> and she's coming back home now to where she was born. 60, I mean, 63 years ago. Hallelujah. So it's a very story visit. Um, whenever we host guest ministers, we always give people an opportunity to be a blessing. And we want to do that also this time. But it's as you are led. Please, if you are led to be part of, to sow a financial seed into the life of uh, Dr. and Mrs. Bakery, we'll make it simple so that um, because of the way we're regulated as a charity, we don't want to mix that up with um, um, the project and other things that we're doing. So if you want to be part of it, we'll request that you give yours in cash. Because so that we can, because we're not going to move from the church account. We just want to be a blessing to them cash-wise. So if you want to be part of that, make sure you see me. So if you want to, uh, we, just, we just want to do it in cash. And we trust God that the Lord will speak to uh, different people. Uh, um, that is one of the fathers in the body of Christ in Nigeria. Uh, one of the fourth generation fathers. And I think we should honor him. So I'm, I'm believing God that God will speak to certain of us um, so how do we get the cash across? Just make sure you see me. Once you want to be part of that, is it that you see me after service or call me later today? I will tell you where to bring the cash to. Uh, I don't, we don't even want transfer. Just whatever you want to give, go to, it's also honorable. Go to the bank yourself, withdraw the amount because, so that we can give it to them in cash. There are some people you don't ask for their account number. It's not good. You just present whatever you want to present and you trust God to, you know. So uh, we want people to do that. But again, it's not compulsory. It is those who are led. You want to, or maybe you've been thinking about it before that, okay, how can I be a blessing to a uh, uh, father that is coming? And, and you want to do that. Or now that you are hearing, your heart is saying you need to be part of that. Those are the people we're talking about. And we put it together. And by the grace of God, we'll present it to them when they come. Don't forget that it's also him and his wife. We just want to honor both of them. And, and because they don't live in Nigeria, please don't try to buy gifts because it will be a burden. 
to carry some of those things, but let's monetize everything. Let's just give, except you are led specifically to buy a gift. But a gift can be a burden, you know? A to, uh, the last time I went to Nigeria, the gift that they gave me, I just ended up giving out everything. Because I was like, where do I want to put all this in my bag now? I mean, you go to this way, they give you this, you go to that. And I ministered in about five cities. And everybody was, I just got overwhelmed. I just thought, okay, take them to Lagos. And when I got to Lagos, I said, do you need this? Oh, you take, okay, man, this, God bless you, God bless you. Take, oh, bring your son. Oh, take that, all right, fine. My bag is light now, I can travel. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> that thing used to annoy people. Pastor Morning will remember when we were on campus. People would give me something now. And the next minute, I'll give it out. So a shirt that they gave me, they would just see somebody in fellowship wearing it to fellowship the next Sunday. <laughs> and they'll be so annoyed. But we gave you. And I said, you have given me. So it's mine. It's no longer yours. So can't I do what I like with what is mine? Why should you give an attached string to read again? Amen. All right. So that's about that. Let's give this morning. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for giving seed to the sower, bread to the eater, establishing it on this principle of sowing and reaping, giving and receiving, multiplying the seed sown, and increasing the fruit of our righteousness in Jesus' name. Please, that's the account on the screen. And for the project, which is the movement into our new venue, if you want to do that, there's a project account. 